Good morning. Uh, hello. Uh, we are here for the uh, Moren Nevuchim Shir, and you are watching on the webyeshiva.org Facebook page, and we're going to get started in just a moment, uh, on Moren Nevuchim, first section, chapter 43. This is Daniel Karapkin, and we are using the Pines edition, uh, the Pines translation of the Rambam's Moren Nevuchim from the Arabic into English. Uh, in the Pines edition, we are on page 93 for chapter 43. Uh, and we are going to be analyzing the word kanaf today. The word kanaf means wing, and we'll see how that's relevant. Let's just get our bearings for a moment and recall what we were studying last week in chapter 42. Um, I left off with a bit of a, um, a quandary uh, in the writing of the Rambam in chapter 42. Um, if we were to characterize what the primary theme of the Rambam's Moren Nevuchim up to date to where we are at this section in the, in, the, in the work, we would probably be tempted to say that the Rambam's primary project, or his focus, is to remove any kind of corporeal attribution to God. And certainly that's one of his projects, although it becomes apparent as we move along through the Sefer that that's not his sole project, and he sort of shifts out of that project in a, in a very subtle transition. That transition was most noticeable in chapter 42 because he analyzed the word chai, or chayim, which means alive or living. And he used it in the context not to, he used this word chai as an opportunity not to remove any anthropomorphic quality from God of saying that wherever we find references to a living God, it does not mean living in the way that we know it. That's the way Rabbi Huda Halevi d discusses the word chai in the context of God, but rather he used this chapter to tell us the different definitions of the word chai and how it relates to the endowment of knowledge or of intellect to man. So uh, the last thing that we learned in the last chapter was that in order, sometimes scripture, when it says that a person is alive, it means they are endowed with additional intellect. And this, we pointed out, according to the commentaries, alludes to the fact that for the Rambam, the key to immortality is to have an enhanced intellect. And it may, quite, it may be quite possible that the Rambam's belief is, and we'll have to see as we go through the Sefer, the entire work, is that that which is immortal about the human being, that which lives on after death, is indeed the human intellect, because that is the only thing that is truly disembodied from the individual. And therefore, uh, it becomes clear that there's a second side to this coin of, of pointing out that God is non-corporeal. And that is, is that the sole non-corporeal aspect of man is man's intellect. And therefore, when we want to try and create a connection between the human being and God, it has to be, be purely on the basis of the human intellect bonding with the divine intellect. And that's a perhaps a, uh, a similar project that the Rambam is addressing at this point in Moren Nevuchim, to point out that it is through the intellect and the intellect alone, and the perfection of the intellect, that man accomplishes the concept called devekut, or attachment to the divine. And that seems to be the way, the direction that the Rambam is going. Now, think about that when we enter into chapter 43, where the Rambam is going to return to his project of, of removing corporeality from God by pointing out that even though the word kanaf, which means wing, refers to a physical appendage of a living creature, nevertheless when it's used in the context of the Almighty or some, kind, or some of God's creatures like angels who are disembodied, when we find the word wing being attached to, to those uh, uh, non-corporeal beings, it means something completely non-corporeal, and that's really going to be the theme. But in, the, in that context, it's also going to become apparent that when we talk about God's wings, it's also going to be the idea of having to do something with the intellect, 
or the divinity of the intellect, or man's intellect requiring some kind of esoteric or uh, disembodied knowledge, um, or advanced kind of knowledge of that which is normally concealed from the physical world. So I'd like you to keep all of those concepts in mind as we jump into the language now of, uh, of chapter 43. Uh, just as, uh, as I point out every time, there's a handout that accompanies our, our discussion, and you can find that handout, it's a, just a one-page handout today, uh, in, on Facebook. If you open up the new Facebook link on your browser, it's in Shi'ur in Morenevuchim. We usually post the handout in a PDF form the day or the night before the shear, and I would encourage you, if you're listening to this uh, shear, that you join that Facebook group so that you'll be apprised of when there's a new handout that's posted. There are four definitions that the Rambam gives us in this chapter to the word kanaf, which we uh, uh, colloquially uh, translate as wing. Uh, the first is, the simplest understanding of the word kanaf is the wing of a living creature, which would be birds in our case, or bats perhaps. Number two, the word kanaf can refer to the corner of a garment, like the tzitzit is attached to the kanaf of the garment. Number three, the word kanaf can refer to a remote location at the end of the world. And finally, number four, which is the main event of this chapter, is the definition of the word kanaf, especially when it's referring to disembodied kanafayim, disembodied wings, it refers to that which is concealed. And we're going to focus more on that momentarily. So let's look at the text. It's a short chapter today. Kanaf is an equivocal term, and its equivocality, meaning that it has multiple meanings depending on its context, is mostly due to its being used in a figurative sense. Most of the times when you find the word kanaf in Tanakh, it will not mean literally wing. So let's see. The first meaning given to it is that of a wing of the living being, beings that fly. Thus, uh, and the Rambam chooses for some strange reason, a pasuk in Devarim chapter 4, Tavnit kol behima asher ba'aretz, tavnit kol tzipor kanaf asher ta'uf ba'shamayim. Here the Torah is referring to the prohibition of fashioning I idols or icons of, of beings that we deify. And the Torah says that you're not allowed to form for yourself the image of any animal or any bird. And the way that the Torah refers to a bird is kol tzipor kanaf, any bird with wings that you may want to fashion as a form of an idol. Could be that the reason why the Rambam chooses this particular Pasuk is because, as we'll see later on, the wing may have some significance to an idolater who ascribes some kind of spiritual quality to the Kanaf, and that's why he may be tempted to create this kind of idol. So, but literally it means a wing of an object, of a, of a living creature, as is uh, an example that you may want to make an image of a bird with a wing. Number two. Subsequently, it was applied figuratively to the extremities and corners of garments. Thus, gidilim ta'aselach, the Torah says, make for yourself fringes or strings al arba kanfot kesutecha asher techa seba. As the Torah says in Deuteronomy chapter 22, make for yourselves fringes on the four corners of your garment. And the word corner is kanfot. A kanaf is a corner of a garment, and it's very self-evident why, just like a bird has wings on its extremities, so too a garment has those kinds of extremities on the corners, which resemble a form of a wing. When a person wears a garment, the corners of his garment are like his wings, like the extremities of his, uh, of his garment. Okay, afterwards, it was applied figuratively to the farthest ends and extremities of the habitable part of the earth, which are remote from the places where we live. And so here the Rambam gives us two examples. There are three and four in your handout. One is from the book of Job, Le'echoz b'chanfo ta'aretz v'ino'aru rishaim imena, that God will grab hold of the corners of the earth, the farthest reaches of the earth, and shake the wicked from it. Okay, so therefore, you see that it's used to refer to, just like we say in English, the four corners of the earth, or the farthest corners of the earth. 
Okay, so a corner is not only the corner of a garment, but it's the corner of the earth, a kanaf. And just like a corner of a garment is called a kanaf, so too the corners of the earth. And Isaiah says, Mikanaf haaretz zimirot shamanu. That Isaiah chapter 24 says that from the farthest point of the earth, we have heard singing, or we have heard a refrain, tzivila tzadik, that there will be some kind of benefit to the, to the righteous. But here again, we have uh, from the uttermost wing of the earth, on the most corner of the earth. Okay. We're not going to look into the contexts of Job or Isaiah. They're not really germane to our discussion today, but I encourage you to look, look into that yourself. Now we get into the main event, which is the fourth definition. And here, the Rambam brings a Hebraist by the name of Ibn Janach. Ibn Janach was a Hebraist of the 11th century. Um, and Rav Kafich, uh, in his uh, translation of Moren of Uchi, makes a fascinating point. And that is that this is the only place in all of Moren of Uchim that the Rambam cites Ibn Janach as one of his Hebraist, Hebraic sources. And Ibn Janach wrote what is known as the Sefer Hashorashim. There are few authors that wrote Sefer Hashorashim. The most famous Sefer Hashorashim is that of the Radak, Rav David Kimchi of the 13th and 14th century. But before then, there was a Sefer Hashorashim of Rabbeinu Yona Ibn Janach. I don't know if you can see that uh, on your screen, but that's uh, this is a copy of it. And he was an Arabist and a, and a Hebraist. And the Rambam cites him and he says that the term can also occur with the signification of concealing as it is akin to the Arabic in which one may say kanaftu, uh, a thing meaning I have concealed it. Kanaftu, the, the, the verb, uh, the, the suffix tu is like the suffix t in Hebrew. So if I were to say darastu, I studied, right? So you would say... Um, uh, kanaftu, which means I did something verbal having to do with kanaf. And what does that mean? That I have concealed something. Now I have to point out a couple of things. First of all, um, when you look up in a, in a standard uh, Arabic dictionary, I use the El Maurid uh, dictionary because I find it, because it's considered to be, I believe, the most authoritative and most comprehensive Arabic, standard Arabic dictionary. Uh, when you look up the verb kanafa in Arabic, you see that it has to do with protection or watching over or guarding, which is normally what we would associate with um, kenafayim, that the sheltering wings, okay, sheltering wings is what we call the kenafayim of God, right? But that's not the way uh, the, uh, the Rambam says that the conventional Arabic using, citing Ibn Janach, that's not what uh, kanafa means in Arabic in his time. And this is an example of how it, language can sometimes evolve over the course of time. In today's Arabic, kanafa or kanaf, used, when used verbally, implies providing shelter or protection or patronage um, or sp sponsorship. But in the times of Ibn Janakh in the 11th century, it also can mean to conceal something. Just like you cover something with the wings, so that you cannot see the body of the bird because it's covered by its wings. That's what the word kanaf, when it's used in Arabic in a verbal form. And therefore, when you find it in Hebrew, which is the sister language to Arabic, it also implies uh, to the, con the concealment of something. And we'll see that this is most expedient for the Rambam in his, when he gets to the idea of angels having wings, because the Rambam feels that anything that is otherworldly, that transcends the physical, is something which is esoteric and concealed from man. And that's really the theme that he wishes to build on and his encouragement of man to transcend that which is exposed and revealed and to enter into the esoteric and the concealed world of the divinity of the divine realm where the angels reside. So, um, he accordingly interprets the verse, um, you shall not... Uh, you shall not thy... Now, I'm not going to read Pines's translation of this verse from Isaiah. This is a verse from Isaiah in chapter 30. It's a very obscure passage in Hebrew, and we're just going to read it, uh, the words in Hebrew. 
V'natan lachem Hashem lechem tsar umayim lachatz, that the Lord will give you the bread of affliction and the water of oppression, and v'lo yikaneif od morecha, and there will no longer be a kanafing, okay, the the verbal form of kanaf will never occur to morecha, to your more. Now there are two ways of translating this pasuk. What Isaiah is coming to tell the people is that there will come a time when your sense of privation will be eliminated and you will be enlightened once again to see blessing in your life. That's really the theme of this verse in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 20. Rashi explains that the word velo yikaneif, exactly like Ibn Janach, lo yitkasem mimcha bikanaf bigadav, that God will no longer co cover or conceal with the corners of his garment. When you want to conceal something, you take your garment and you place your garment over that thing which you, which you wish to conceal. And in a sense, God is basically, the uh, prophet is saying that God will no longer conceal all of the blessings of your life. He will reveal himself to you and he will reveal his blessings to you. Radak explains it slight, slightly different. Upiresh lo yikaneif lo ye aseif velo ye atzer. The way he explains it is the same way that in, in the Talmud you have the Aramaic word kinufia, which means a gathering or an assemblage of people. When you want to say, when you want to use the word kanaf in the verbal form, it means to gather in or remove. And so essentially, the, according to Radak, to be konaf something is to withdraw it from someone or, or something. So it's not concealing it but rather withdrawing it. Now, they may be used in, uh, interchangeably in certain contexts, but there's clearly a difference between the idea of concealing something and withdrawing something. Okay, so um, those are two translations. The Rambam chooses the translation of Ibn Janach and of Rashi. Why couldn't the Rambam simply use the translation of Rashi? Why did he have to, have to tap into the translation of Ibn Janach. So Rav Kafich says something fascinating over here. He says, you know what the word Janach means in Arabic? It means a wing. And so the Rambam is playing us a little bit. He's being a little bit, a little bit playful with us. And what he's essentially doing is taking the name of a Hebraist who has composed the Sefer Shoroshim, which is in accord, he uses the word kanaf in the accord with the way the Rambam would like to use the word kanaf, and the reason why specifically he references, and the only time he references Ibn Janach is in this one time, is because Janach in Arabic means a wing. We use it even in modern Arabic. If you want to say the wing of a plane, you also call it a Janach. Anyway, that's just an interesting aside. The reason why I'm not going to translate the verse according to Pines is because Pines seems to be an error over here based on an erroneous girsa, an erroneous addition that he may have had of the Rambam's Mora Nevuchim. He translates the words velo yikaneif od morecha, meaning the enlightener shall not be concealed and hidden from you anymore, that God will no longer be concealed, and God is called your more, your instructor or your teacher. As, but as a matter of fact, when you look into Ibn Janach, you see that Ibn Janach's translation of the word more is the way the Radak translates the word more from the word rainfall, like yore umalkosh. The Torah says talks about different kinds of rainfall depending upon the stage they are in the season of rain. And yore is the early rain that comes to uh, provide uh, 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 nutrition to the newly growing crops. And therefore, Ibn Janach says explicitly in his Sefer Shorashim that the word more means rainfall, does not mean your instructor. And therefore, the way he translates it is, your rainfall will no longer be concealed because your blessings will be now be manifest and you will receive the rain in the proper time. So the Radak only differs because he says, instead of it meaning that your rainfall will no longer be concealed, he learns it as your rainfall will no longer be withdrawn or deprived. But the idea is the same, but the word more does not mean that you will receive, that God will now be exposed, 
but rather it means that your rainfall will be exposed to you. Uh, why Pines translated it differently is because he must have had, according to Kafich, he must have had a different girsa in the Rambam. But if you look in the Ibn Tibon Hebrew, there is no reason to translate it the way that uh, Pines translates it. And therefore, we're going to move on from that. But the Rambam writes that this is a good explanation, that as far as the verb kanaf is concerned, to say that it means concealment is actually correct. In my opinion, this meaning occurs also in the verse, and he shall not uncover the wing of his father. When the Torah says that a man may not marry his father's wife, it then says, Velo ye gale kenaf aviv. Let him not expose that which of his father is his kanaf. Now, normally we say that it means don't expose the garment of your father, which is a euphemism for saying that that which your father keeps, um, uh, which, which your father reserves for the bedroom where he, where he disrobes, that you may not uh, uh, be involved with. Do not expose that, having to do with your father's wife. But the Rambam says that the word kanaf literally means concealment. Do not expose the concealment of your father is what the words kanaf aviv means. And which means that he shall not uncover that of his father, which is concealed, which is the, his most intimate of re, physical relationships with his wife. Similarly, the verse, spread therefore thy wings over thy handmaid, which is a verse from the book of Ruth, where Ruth uh, uh, confronts Boaz in the middle of the night in his bedroom, and he wakes up in fright, realizing that there's someone that is lying at the foot of his bed. And he says, Vayomer miat, and he says, who is this? And, he, and she says, Batomer anochi rut amatecha, chapter 3, verse 9, Ufarastach chenafecha al amatcha ki goelata. I want you to spread your kanaf on your maiden, meaning upon me, because you are the redeemer. So what does that mean? So normally, without this translation of concealment, we would say that the word kanaf means place your shelter or your protection over me. That's really what she's asking for. But the Rambam says, no, it doesn't mean protection. It doesn't mean shelter. It means concealment. And therefore, it has to be interpreted, in my opinion, as meaning spread that by which thou you conceal over your handmaid, which is a sexual innuendo. It means, basically, uh, I want you to normally take that which is covered in your body and place it over me because we're going to have an intimate union because I'm going to become your wife. That's essentially what she was saying. In my opinion, it is in this sense that wing is figuratively applied to the Creator, may he be exalted, and also to the angels. And here's where the Rambam gets to his main point, and that is that when you talk about the wings of God or the wings of God's angels, we are talking about that which is concealed about God or that which is concealed about his angels. For according to our opinion, the angels have no bodies as I shall make clear. Later on in chapter 49, which is not that far off, the Rambam is going to enter into a conversation about the angels that are described in Tanakh, in the book of Yechezkel, in the book of Isaiah, in other places as well. And the angels are described in, in a corporeal way, but according to the Rambam, angels are the ultimate disembodied beings. They are, be, they are beings of sentience, of thought, but do not have any corporeal attributes whatsoever. So anytime you discover the, the uh, scripture describing them in corporeal manner, it is purely metaphorical. Angels don't have wings, in the sense that you and I would think of wings, but it's merely a mental illustration, a metaphor. And therefore, accordingly, the interpretation of the dictum of, of Scripture, under whose wings you have come to trust, this is earlier in the book of Ruth, where uh, uh, Naomi, or I'm sorry, Boaz says to Ruth, Yishalem Hashem Pa'olech, may God pay back all of your efforts, Utihi maskurtech shalema, and may your uh, compensation from God be complete, Asher bat lachasot tachat kenafav, that you have come to take shelter under his wings. Now here too, when we talk about the wings of God, and by the way, there's a very famous liturgy that we say, the kel mole rachamim, where we talk about the dead being tachat kanfea shechina, or al kanfea shechina, either on the sheltering wings of God or beneath the sheltering wings of God, 
we normally translate those wings as sheltering wings. And that's normally how we would translate this Pasuk. However, the Rambam says it's referring to concealment. It should be that you have come to be hidden under that by which he conceals. And in essentially, it may refer to being sheltered or protected by God, but that shelter refers to some type of concealment, that through your being concealed by God, you are thereby protected, or you're con you are concealed from the rest of the world, perhaps, because by becoming a Jew, you have sort of segregated and concealed yourself from the rest of the world. Similarly, in all cases in which wing occurs with reference to the angels, it signifies that which conceals. Will you not consider the dictum of Scripture? And here he gets to a pasuk in the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verse 2, which is the introductory verse to the famous trisagion, or the tripled kadosh, that we say in our prayers, Kadosh, 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 Hashem Tzivakot, Melochal Haaretz Kivodo. That statement of holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the world is filled with his glory, is a verse which is recited in Isaiah chapter 6 by the angels. And Isaiah says, I had a vision of these angels, and in my vision of these angels, these angels had six wings. And these six wings, Bishtayim uh, Yechasepanav, with two of its wings, the two top wings, the angel would cover its face. Uvishtayim yechaser aglav, with two wings it would cover its feet. Uvishtayim yeofeth, and with the remaining two wings, the, ostensibly the two middle wings, it would fly with those wings. Now that's a very, very corporeal, um, anthropomorphic kind of attribution to beings who are completely disembodied. So the Rambam feels it's his responsibility to explain this. This means that the cause of his existence, I mean that of the angel, is most hidden and concealed, that cause being indicated by the expression, his face. Angels are very mysterious beings. How they come into being and what their purpose is, is very hidden from man. And that idea of the angel being mysterious and hidden from man is, sig is si signified or is represented by the fact that the angel's face, which is the part of a person's body which is most revelatory about the feelings and desires of the, the human being, when you cover the face, then you don't get to see, you know, the, the true makeup of the person. Today we're all wearing masks when we go outside, so we can relate to this idea. When you see someone with a mask, you can't really tell what that person is really all about. So when Isaiah describes the angels covering their face with their wings, it means that the kanaf is a concealing tool. And that's the idea behind the mystery of the malachim of the angels. And similarly, the things of which he, I mean the angel, is the cause, these being his feet, as we have made clear when dealing with the equivocality of the word foot, are also, he, are also hidden. If you recall, back in chapter 28, the Rambam had launched into a, an explanation of the word regel. And one of the explanations of the word regel, which is foot, the way we colloquially translate it, is that uh, regel means biglal, or the cause of something. So something could be the regel of something, but it means that it's the cause of something. An angel is a causative being. It brings into being a number of phenomena, even in the physical world, because the word malach, by its very definition, is an agent of God, does God's bidding to bring about certain things in our world. And therefore, when we talk about the angel's feet being covered, it means that the causations of the angels are hidden as well. And that's the, that's the image of the two wings concealing the feet or the causations of the angels. For the acts of the intellects are hidden, and their effects become clear only after one has trained oneself. The Rambam calls these angels intellects because they're beings of pure intellect. This is due to two causes. Why is it that these angels and their causations are hidden from us? He says it's for, for, for two reasons, one of which should be referred to them and one to us, meaning one having to do with the angels and one having to do with the human condition. I mean, number one, the weakness of our apprehension, the human being simply has the, uh, does not have the ability with his 
weakened intellect to be able to perceive how angels bring about certain things in our world. So that's the first reason why we don't see immediately the causations of the angels around us. And number two, the difficulty of apprehending in its true reality that which is separate from matter. And number two, the angels inherently are difficult to apprehend, are diff difficult for man to intellectually grasp. And therefore, that's the reason why uh, the angel's face is covered and the angel's feet are covered. Now, why do? what about the remaining two wings, which are used for an angel to fly? What does it mean for an angel to be in flight? What is the significance of that imagery? As for the dictum of scripture, and with two the angel flies, I shall explain in a separate chapter in what sense the motion of flying is attributed to the angels. Now we're just going to jump ahead for the last minute or two of our, of our class today. It, you have on your sheet the very last paragraph of Moren of uh, section 1, chapter 49, which we'll get to in just a few weeks anyway. But the Rambam launches into an explanation of angels in a much more extensive way in chapter 49. And in the course of explaining angels, he also explains why scripture describes angels as flying, flying with wings. So what does that mean? So I'm jumping in into the middle of the par paragraph for the sake of brevity. Know that everyone who accomplishes a very swift movement is described as flying, so as to indicate the swiftness of the, move of the movement. Thus scripture says, as the eagle swoops down, for the eagle is swifter in his flight and swoop than any other bird, for this reason it is used in the parable. Know also that the two wings are the cause of causes of flying. For this reason, the number of wings seen in the prophetic vision correspond to that of the causes of motion of a moving thing. However, this is not the subject of this chapter. Without going into too much depth for the sake of brevity, the Rambam understands that the two remaining wings of the uh, Isaiah vision angel that has six wings, the two of those wings that fly means that the angel carries forth its uh, specified uh, objective, its specified project or mission in a very swift way. And to describe the swiftness of the angel's execution, flight is used metaphorically to describe the swiftness of that angel's execution. And so that for the Rambam is ultimately the meaning of the word kanaf to conclude our discussion for today. The word kanaf means that which is concealed. The reason why it's used in the context both of God and of God's angels is because the esoteric realm, that which transcends the physical, is so hidden from man's intellect that one way of describing that hiddenness is to use the word kanaf, which means wing, but it also means something which is concealed. And therefore we conclude this chapter, and what we've basically explained is that not only is the Rambam removing corporeality from God in the course of this chapter, but he's also in the same time explaining how difficult and elusive it is for man to use his intellect to attach to that which is in the divine realm because of its hiddenness, because of its kanaf nature. And with that, we'll conclude. I wish you a wonderful day and a wonderful week.